Now this is just me, but there is something about trains that engage in the concept of the other for me. I grew up in the woods where train tracks were a mile or two away. And so most nights you could hear the whistle of the train as it went by, or the gentle roar of a train in a distance. In some ways they're an extraordinarily everyday event. Train tracks tend to run right through most cities. They run right by most busy highways, or at least for portions of them. And yet, there's parts of the train track that veer off into the deep woods, the deep unpopulated spots that passenger cars will never really have access to. Now, again, I'm speaking from personal experience, and this is as a Southern American, so I'm not saying that when Robert Aikman wrote The Trains, he was necessarily engaging in all of those thoughts, though there is a distinct sense that he is engaging in the everydayness of the trains with their weirdness outside of the everyday. What makes a story Aikman-esque? While most Aikman stories feel like Aikman stories, sometimes the elements that clearly seem to define one don't necessarily define another. Usually you see middle class, uh, upper middle class, people of means, not necessarily rich, um, but people who don't necessarily have to worry about money. Um, in fact, speaking of richness or wealth, um, in a lot of cases, it seems like the people were possibly richer in the past or come from a wealthy family that's declined. Characters tend to be at odds with society. They tend to be lonely. Uh, literal dislocation um, happens a lot. They've moved. They're expatriates. They, they're on travel. Um, sexual confusion shows up a lot. The, the gap between men and women tend to be intensified. Um, a lot of Eggman stories involve female protagonists, but in most cases, when you have a male or a female main character, the opposite sex tends to be really distant and odd and kind of hard to calculate. It's pretty common that you get a repetition of visual themes. Another huge chunk of an Aikman story is the narrative lacunae. It's an absence. It's something that isn't approached or explained in the story. It can be a literal missing of events. It can be a missing element of explanation can be a grounding factor. And Aikman tends to use some sort of absence in every story you read by him. And that may be an over-exaggeration or over-generalization, but it's very, very common. Like sometimes you're just missing some behind-the-scenes information that makes everything feel a little bit weird and ghostly. Occasionally you're missing sort of like a reason, that grounding element I was talking about. You're missing part of the story that sort of explains the story. Sometimes you're just missing sort of the historical reason of the event. Occasionally you're missing an outcome. Occasionally you're missing the line that delimitates between when the story is literal and, and when it becomes more figurative. There is an interesting quote in the introduction to um, we Are For The Dark, which is the story that the trains, are sorry, which is the collection that the trains originally shows up in, and the introduction written by um, Ray Russell of Tartarus Press includes a quote from Glenn Cavaliero, which reads, some of his tales resemble weird jigsaw puzzles from which the central piece is missing, a piece which would otherwise have rendered this picture coherent and appraisable. And it's, it's kind of a lovely little uh, quote in that it does sort of sum up the frustration as a reader you can have reading Aikman. Like, well, if you would have just explained. The problem with it as a quote is that often the missing piece is absolutely essential as a missing piece to understanding the story. In his book, Robert Aikman, an introduction, Gary William Crawford regularly, um, as one of the major theses of the book, discusses Aikman in terms of surrealism. For me, uh, a more m recent term, irrealism, 
fits more with what Aikman is trying to get. A couple of quotes about irrealism. Just something to keep in mind as I'm talking about the story. In the Irreal Reader, G.S. Evans has a chapter called Irrealism is Not Surrealism, and he's talking about it in a specific um, piece of work and, and expanded upon that, but a quote that I think is very useful to Aikman is, Irrealism, which also considers the dream state to be a fundamental importance, differs from surrealism in that it very much sees itself as being in the realm of art and artistic technique. An irrealist might write a story that was inspired by and used elements of a particular dream, but would not report the dream directly. It therefore considers consciousness to be integral to its work and not just an obstacle. Another one from Dean Swinford from Defining Irrealism, Scientific Development and Allegorical Possibility. The irrealist work then operates within a given system and attests to its plausibility, despite the fact that this system and the world it represents is often a mutation and aberration. And this kind of works with the ghost story as Aikman told it. Jack Sullivan in Elegant Nightmares, and this is as quoted in Crawford's book, but it says, Ghost stories sabotage the relationship between cause and effect. The parts are self-consistent, but they relate to an inexplicable, irrational whole. You have this notion in Aikman of the ghost story and the irreal story, and they're kind of the same story. The idea that we as humanity are engaging in a game in which at some point in time, the everyday notion of sense, the everyday notion of rationality, has to be discarded because those rules only work by something like an arbitrary decision in society. And just as soon as someone is slightly outside of society, they begin being exposed to rules that are far beyond their expectations. Turning to the trains, the story we're going to be talking about today, and why I've chosen it as sort of my introduction to Aikman. Well, for one, it's one of the stories in the original Aikman collection, We Are For The Dark, one that he wrote with his lover at the time, Elizabeth Jane Howard. The stories were published as a collaboration. There were six stories. There was some initial confusion as to whether the six stories were you know, collaborations between both of them, or um, how what defined it as a collaboration. We now know that three of the stories are Howard's and three of the stories are Aikman's, the trains being one of Aikman's. And in the story you have two women. You have Margaret, who is the very Aikman character. She's not super attractive. She comes from a family that was, uh, was rich, like a lord, but they have now gone more into debt. There's Mimi, who is the more attractive, physically assertive, um, sort of normal character who likes to get out in the woods and is a little bit more hip and plans ahead and is, uh, considers herself more common sense. And more people are just immediately attracted to Mimi than to Margaret. And they're going on this hiking holiday and they get to a place called the Quiet Valley. And there's no explanation given as to why it's the Quiet Valley, but here they meet a guy in a, an off-license, and they're drinking tea and coffee, and he's telling them that there's this house where there's this Miss Roper who always waves at the train, because there's this notion that uh, men wave at women, and then women wave back at trains, and it's, it's, it's kind of an odd little um, sexual dance as described in the story. So as they continue on on the hiking trip, comes down a massive rain pour, and in the dark and stormy night, kind of cliche, poss possibly on purpose as a, as a statement about ghost stories, they come to this dark house, maybe Miss Roper's house, and they knock on it looking for 
um, shelter from the storm. What they find is that Miss Roper's dead, and her nephew, Windley Roper, and Beach, manservant, is all that remains, and it's this dark and dreary house, and it's kind of absorbed by the trains. Like, the train track goes right by it, and the house is dark because all of the the smoke from the trains has stained it black, and a lot of the decorations are reminiscent of trains and or are directly taken from a train. It's just a house that's been absorbed by trains. You get these events where, like, Margaret goes upstairs and comes back down, and Winley and Mimi have been having a conversation, and then you start hearing about some weird things, like how why Joe, Winley's grandfather, how he died, which was one night he thought he heard a tree fall on the train tracks and went out to investigate and got hit by the train. And at least that's how it's implied, even though there was no tree falling. And you get cases where, like, what was Miss Roper doing up in the room that turns out to have bars on the windows? The building of the railroad tracks through this section of the world took 20 years and had all sorts of weird setbacks, none of which are explained. And eventually you get a glimpse of what's going on, but most of the time you get the sensation that it's like a ghost story or a monster story, but you're following the wrong character. And there is, I mean, just kind of going back to the themes of narrative lacunae, you have all kinds of questions. Why is it called the Quiet Valley? What happened to cause the railroad tracks to take that long to be laid? What actually happened to Wide Joe? Did he just merely grow senile and confused, or was there something horrible out there in the valley that sounded like trees falling? What is the secret that Miss Roper knew that Winley wanted? Like, what is the horrible thing that Winley would do with it if he gets the secret? What happens downstairs between Mimi and Winley that she runs away from? What's up with this weird train? that has a whistle that sounds completely different and seems to be part of some unknown kind of dark secret about trains going in the middle of the night. The ghost doesn't show up. I mean, it feels like a haunted house. It seems to, it has all of the flavors of a haunted house. The the weather, the, the, the visual darkness, the abandoned rooms that maybe aren't as abandoned, the, the spotting of people down the hall that when you're not, you didn't think someone else was there. Uh, the claustrophobic elements of it, the hint that something bad has gone on in the valley, the hint that something bad has gone on in the house, the hint that there's some dark secret. And you start getting repetitious elements. Um, in this case, one of the big repetitions, besides the waving at the train and trains in general, and train elements and train visuals, you get the four stones as one of the most striking repeated moments. When they lay the map down, they put four stones, and then when they take the map up, the stones remain. For whatever reason, the four is important. It shows up as more than just the stones. You've got multiple cases of the four stones. You get four people at, at the tea house. You get four people at the Roper house. In towards the end, you get four piles of train tickets. So there's this repetition of four, and it's never explained, but again, it's just sort of a driving force to make you realize, or feel, sense, maybe instinctively sense, that there are rules here that you're not necessarily being made entirely privy to. There was, apparently, a TV adaptation of The Trains, and it's lost. Um, I'm not even sure how extant it is in the sense of you start researching it and there was a 1980s show called Night Voices that included a number of Aikman stories and a couple of the episodes, the hospice being one of them, has surfaced in a few sort of bootleg editions and people have watched it, but I can't find any information outside of people's odd memory like they heard that this actress was in it, etc. About the one about the trains. I would love to see it just because I'm curious to see what they would focus on towards the end. For me, the best Aikman-esque, not Aikman, but Aikman-esque movie 
is Barbarian Sound Studio, and I'll link to the IMDb page for it. It features a person who is sexually confused, who is on travel, who is confused by handling people in the real world, who is confused by money and how to make ends meet, who seems to be good at their job but is also just at a moment of law they're suffering from a loss of center and as it goes towards the end it becomes increasingly dreamlike and it has an ending which I would consider um, inexplicable and I highly recommend it and um, I, I think it's a good vibe for hitting most of the things that make Aikman stories worth reading but as a movie that, as far as I know, wasn't intended to be an Aikman movie or Aikman-esque movie, but it definitely hits a lot of the, uh, the high points. Well, okay, guys, so that pretty much ends this episode. My next episode I'm planning on looking at is uh, Thomas Ligotti's The Frolic, which, kind of like The Trains, isn't necessarily the best story to get into all the aspects, the dream, the dreamlike aspects that drive the, the author's usual fare, but can be quite good because it brings up some of the elements and um, its own particular way. And I have no idea how long it'll be before that episode comes out. I'll hopefully have it soon. <laughs> this one took forever because of some computer issues, but keep it weird. But in general, I think you have to engage in the story as a whole and analysis trying to cut off this line or that line or this paragraph or that paragraph to come up with the definition of the story. You can only come up with definitions for that line or that paragraph for that reading. And in order to define the trains, you have to do it um, nebulously kind of from a distance as a whole. And I quite like that. And then it, it reads like a good story. It's not necessarily scary. It's almost more of a... Comedy's not the right word, but it's the first word that comes to mind. <laughs>